Good evening. I'd like to call to order the regular yes. council meeting yeah. of Wednesday, February 20th at 7 p.m. And we have an agenda in front of us. Are there any additions to the agenda? Thank you. A motion to adopt the agenda as presented. Moved and seconded. All in favor? Thank you. And we have a delegation. Emmanuel Machado, CAO, Town of Gibsons. Dave Newman, Director of Infrastructure Services from Town of Gibsons. Please step up and share your words of wisdom. And push the button. Thank you. Thanks very much for having us. So we'll just do a bit of a tag team. Okay. I usually don't need a mic. Anyway, thank you very much for uh, for having us. The um, uh, the first slide's already out of date. Uh, we changed the meeting with the SCRD to a, uh, a March meeting. Um, so, um, but uh, most of them, well, no, actually, I don't know if they've seen this one before. Um, anyway, we're here to, to share a bit of information with you about the town's water system, um, how it works, and, and what some of our initiatives are, some of our exploration into uh, natural asset management. Um, We'll mention the bulk water supply we have with the SCRD and then uh, talk a little bit about uh, regional governance as it pertains to, uh, to water supply on the coast. So first off, uh, overall of our town water supply. At present we have uh, two water sources. Uh, we, we've divided the town up into three pressure zones, one, two, and three. Zones one and two are supplied by the Gibson's aquifer and zone three, the pink area, is uh, serviced by SCRD water. Uh, in the past, uh, the town did uh, service that, um, and uh, I don't recall exact year, but uh, at some point or other, uh, we, we switched over to uh, the SCRD, or water supply from the SCRD for zone three. The three zones uh, allows appropriate pressure to each home business, because uh, if you're familiar with Gibson's, which I'm sure you are, we're on a fairly steep hill, and so uh, as, as you pump water up the hill, the pressure decreases, so uh, we have to divide it into uh, the three pressure zones. Um, historically, the projected aquifer capacity was insufficient to serve the entire, entire town, um, plus there was a, a need for additional infrastructure to service uh, zone three. So the town's water system, we have uh, three wells, three supply wells in Lower Gibsons. Uh, we have two reservoirs, uh, the School Road Reservoir and the Parkland Reservoir. Uh, the water is pumped from the wells up to the School Road Reservoir. And from there, it feeds down into Zone 1, the green area. Uh, the water is then pumped up to Parkland Reservoir and from Parkland Reservoir, that comes down to Zone 2. So those reservoirs, they provide um, balancing flow. They provide uh, um, a reservoir of water uh, for peak hour demands and maximum daily demands when the wells can't keep up. And uh, of course, if we have a fire or, or uh, uh, some other heavy demand for water, the reservoir supply uh, that as well. For Zone 3 water supply, we, we are reliant in, in, uh, in part on, uh, well, we are reliant on the uh, regional district's uh, um, reservoirs, uh, and we have a single point of connection uh, to, the, uh, to the Zone 3 from the SCRD, and uh, water flows into uh, Zone 3 and is separated, physically separated from the aquifer supply. Um, that's important for a number of reasons, but, but one being uh, that Zone 3 or the SCRD water supply is chlorinated. Uh, whereas zones one and two are not. Um, and uh, there's a, a requirement, a health requirement, to have a chlorine residual uh, in the SCRD water supply. And uh, if we uh, allowed the waters to mix, then of course we would dilute that, uh, that required concentration in, in the chlorine. And what that chlorine does, uh, chlorine does a couple things. Um, one, if your water system, is, your water your supply is not uh, pure enough uh, right off the get-go, then uh, it's chlorinated uh, to, uh, to kill any bacteria and make it uh, um, suitable for, for human consumption. Um, and the second thing it does is it provides a barrier so that uh, uh, if you have a, an appropriate residual left in the pipe at the end of the system, uh, should a bug get into that water system, uh, there is chlorine left to, uh, to attack that and kill that bacteria. 
And uh, um, you may remember back in 2014, we actually had our first uh, low water advisory in the town and uh, in zones one and two. Um, and uh, we did not have the chlorine in the water uh, as a routine uh, preventative measure and, and uh, um, consequently we had to have that boil water advisory. Uh, we've since installed um, uh, standby chlorinators uh, so that if ever there is an issue, uh, we turn those chlorinators on and, and uh, um, an ounce of prevention. We, uh, we typically turn them on once a year for, for uh, just to run through the system and keep everybody familiar with all the operators familiar with the system. Uh, and also we, we run it when we are connecting uh, new water mains to our system uh, just to kill any bugs that uh, might, uh, might get in at that, that time. The three X's there, those are called uh, pressure reduction valves and they are valves that in the event of, for instance, a fire in zone one, um, and if we did not have the school road reservoir, if, if that was insufficient water to, uh, uh, to fight the fire, then the valve would open up into zone two, and zone two could then feed water down through. If that was insufficient, then valves open up into zone three and allow zone three water to flow down. Um, and then we also have a booster uh, pump on the SCRD water supply, as well as another PRV uh, should that not be able to keep up as well. So there's lots of uh, checks and balances in place. Uh, so I'm going to touch base on here on our, our new Zone 3 supply initiative. Um, and the question about why, why are we doing it now, why didn't we do it before, and, and you heard me mention that uh, uh, historically there was inf insufficient water in the aquifer to supply Zones uh, 1, 2, and 3. However, um, this is kind of leading into uh, you know, a, a really excellent reason for water metering. Uh, so the model capacity of the aquifer, so we did an extensive modeling uh, of, the, of the aquifer mapping study. We, uh, we determined the extents of the aquifer and, and uh, um, ran a, roughly a four-year program on mapping the aquifer. And it was determined through numerous uh, uh, studies and, and tests that uh, uh, that there was roughly a, a, you know 1.66 million cubic meters of year the year that the required by the town and that the uh, aquifer could supply that um, the assumptions were made that there was going to be a 15 percent reduction in an overall recharge due to wet changing weather patterns a 50 percent reduction in snowpack and a one meter rise in sea level so it was a very conservative estimate but when we don't know exactly what climate change is going to be looking like, uh, that conservative level uh, of um, was was extremely important, uh, especially when you're talking about a water supply. So in 2011, we were roughly at uh, 573 liters per capita per day, um, and the liters per capita per day, what that means in this context is we take our whole water supply. Um, how much water we're actually pumping into the, uh, uh, the distribution system and dividing that equally amongst the population. And as I say, in 2011, that was 573 liters per capita per day. That includes fire flow, it includes business use, uh, it includes uh, uh, operations and maintenance. And depending on, on uh, what your town or city makeup is, that, that liters per capita per day, you could be exactly the same um, in the way of conservation and so on, and it would change depending on your uh, the types of businesses, for example. So if you had a really heavy user, that 573 liters per capita would, would bump up. Uh, if you have less people um, per kilometer of water main, then that would also, uh, uh, you would have more leaks per person. And so uh, uh, you gotta be kind of careful using that uh, comparison, direct comparison between Town and Gibson's is 573 and we are whatever it happens to be. Uh, but we put in meters in 2009 and uh, completed the program, I think it was around 2013, we had the town 100% metered. And now in 2018, our projected uh, use is, is 400 liters per capita per day. Uh, and that means that the total build out of zones one, two, and three uh, is now less than the water uh, that we were anticipating uh, being required for just zones one and two. And that, as I say, is, is largely through metering. Oops, I went backwards. 
Uh, so here's our little success story and, and uh, uh, one of my little graphs I have on my wall. So in, in uh, 2009, we had the, uh, uh, we were roughly at 781 liters per capita. And you can see in 2016 and 17, we dropped down to 350, 300, you know, around 350 liters per capita per day. We've used 400 as uh, our model just because uh, you can see some ebbs and flows in that. Um, so, and I, as I mentioned, the, the 350, just as the 573 was back in 2011, um, the, uh, our current 350 liters per capita per day is all of the town water use divided amongst the population. Whereas our actual metered residential um, use at the at the um, you know at the at the uh, uh, consumer end uh, is less than 200 liters per capita per day. So two different measurements there. Uh, one is strictly residential and average, and the other one is is complete town use. And just a little bit of trivia, uh, uh, in Cape Town in, in 2018, you may recall that they, they had some, ser some serious water issues. They were down to 50 liters per capita per day. So puts, in, puts it into perspective. So the, uh, that was our, our foray into metering. And uh, I can share all sorts of stories about uh, tracking leaks and, and uh, um, the you know, just a tremendous tool that metering has been for us. The, go backwards here a little bit, the, the installation of meters uh, helps in a couple ways. One, it changes people's patterns uh, of, of water use, and, and so they think twice, perhaps, of, of you know, watering their lawn for, for extended periods of time. The, the biggest thing from an engineering end of, end of things is that uh, we can track leaks. Uh, so if somebody's got a leak on their private property, their water service, you don't see it at the, at the uh, uh, ground level. Invariably, you don't see it. Um, and uh, the meters will tell us when there is a leak. And, and we've saved thousands upon thousands of, of uh, meters, of cubic meters of water just through leak tracking. So the RD, they're getting uh, similar results, almost 1,300 leaks discovered uh, by the SCRD through metering. Um, they've found approximately 20% of their services are, were leaking. They've resolved roughly half of them. This is as of March of 2018. I was seeking some updated information from the RD, but uh, did not get it in time for the presentation. Um, but it gives you an idea as to, to uh, uh, the regional district's similar uh, experiences with, with metering. Moving forward, uh, the SCRD has, has saved roughly 2.3 million liters per capita per day, sorry, 2.3 million liters per day through leak repairs. So that translates to 840,000 cubic meters a year. So big numbers, how do we relate? Um, the town in use in 2018, we only use 630 liter, uh, uh, meters per, uh, for the year, 630,000 cubic meters for the year. Upper Gibson's the only area supplied by the RD, we are 215,000 cubic meters. So total town use, the amount of water recovered through SCRD metering is about 1.3 times the total of town of Gibson's water use, and we're almost four times the amount uh, uh, just used by Zone 3, which is uh, the area supplied by SCRD water. And we've got the population of around 4670. So a bit of a success story there on, on both our ends and, and the regional districts uh, so far. The other thing that we have to be careful about when we're, we're sharing this and, and when we're sharing with the public and, and, uh, is that the volume of water is only part of the picture. Uh, you have your average daily demand, uh, where it's just a, you, know, you have a typical, a typical day in, in, uh, for residential water use. However, you also have your maximum daily demand and those, your, your, Every day you would have a maximum daily demand, and that is typically, uh, you know, in the morning or in the evening when people are uh, having showers or cooking dinner. Um, and then, of course, your worst maximum daily demand is likely going to be during the summertime. Um, you also have your peak hour. Uh, sorry, I, I just gave you the definition of peak hour demand. The maximum daily demand is the is the time during the year that you you have the maximum uh, water use. So that's typically twice the average daily demand. Peak hour is typically four times the average daily demand. So those are just kind of rough numbers that uh, uh, you typically use. 
Uh, so water volume, saving it through metering, that's only part of the picture. Uh, you have, have these other uh, uh, water supplies that, uh, or times that you, you have different demands on your system. Um, we also, you also have to be uh, cognizant that you need emergency storage and fire flow. So our planned service of Zone 3 with aquifer water is uh, constructing roughly $2.5 million worth of, of new infrastructure uh, comprised of a, a new well, a booster station to, to boost the pressure to a, a usable um, pressure for, for the residents up in Zone 3, and some water main upgrades. Um, and at this point, the Gibson's aquifer is projected to supply the average daily demand, the maximum daily demand, and the peak hour demand until roughly somewhere between 2030 and 2045, depending on what our growth is. So we're gonna be able to manage everything except emergency storage and fire flow uh, just from the aquifer um, and you know, make a big difference or uh, you know, a fair, fair difference to, to the regional district. We would still be reliant on the, on the regional district for peak hour after we hit that, uh, uh, you know, that, that volume. Um, somewhere, as I say, between 2030 and 2045. I can't recall off the top of my head what population that represents. Um, and then we would be, as I say, reliant on them for emergency storage and fire flow. But we're, we're projected to see a 95 to 98 percent reduction in SCRD water use. And this is part of managing one more of the coast's water systems uh, uh, in the interest of, of um, you know, the entire coast. You know, we're working together to uh, uh, to help the RD out and to, to meet our needs as well. So natural asset management. Um, you've probably heard uh, some of us talk about natural assets in, in town of Gibsons. It's, it's getting a, a, a fair groundswell um, and, and a lot of interest out in, uh, um, in the province um, as well as uh, intercontinental. Uh, examples of natural assets are uh, largely to do with water, and you got a list up there of, of rivers and streams, swamps, aquifers, um, trees, soil, eelgrass, etc. Um, we manage these uh, very similar to, to engineered assets. We kind of started along the aquifer natural capital initiatives uh, in 2005 when, when the OCP identified uh, or, uh, represent, or made a a policy statement that to, to identify the extents of the aquifer, uh, the Gibson's aquifer. In 2009, we did the initiation of the, the mapping study that I mentioned. Uh, we broadened our, our definition of infrastructure to include natural capital. Our definition of natural capital is a natural feature that performs a civil function that the town is responsible for. Uh, in 2013, we, we released the aquifer mapping study that was completed. Um, and then started applying the asset management principles of engineered assets to, uh, um, to managing the Gibson's aquifer. And I'm gonna go into that in a little bit more detail. In 2014, council adopted an asset management policy including recognition of asset, natural assets. Um, and from 2015 onwards, uh, we've been uh, including the Gibson's aquifer as part of our integrated uh, asset management plan. So typically you have some form of these six or seven questions that you ask yourself during when you're when you're doing an asset management program, um, you'll see variations of these. But essentially, they're answering the same questions: What do you own? What's it worth? What's its condition? What's your operations and management plan? What's your financial plan? Doing ongoing assessment, um, and how can it uh, handle uh, increased demand? That is the same for a pipe as it is for a natural asset. So for starters, in the Gibson's aquifer, uh, we uh, established what our inventory was, what, our, what assets we owned, although we don't own the Gibson's aquifer. Uh, we just established it was a sand and gravel aquifer capped by a, a, a virtually impermeable uh, aquitard, uh, a till layer over top. Um, we mapped the extents of the aquifer and determined the recharge area. The next question is, what's it worth? And some of the nat some natural assets are easier to to value than others. Uh, for example, if you're using a creek as, as a stormwater conveyance, you could translate that, translate that straight into what length of pipe would be required if we didn't have that uh, that creek. 
when you're talking about an aquifer, a little bit more difficult to compare you know, something to an, an equal engineered asset, but what would be the alternative if we didn't have that aquifer? Um, why is it important to take care of it? What would we need to do if we if, if something happened to it? Um, so, you know, the, although we have not come up with a, a hard and fast uh, number for the value of the aquifer, what's the cost of establishing a new water source? Uh, what are the financial impacts of running dry? And I almost kind of put that one on the back burner going, don't really need to answer that uh, as far as uh, nailing down a, an exact uh, dollar figure. Um, you can just imagine that it would be fairly extensive. What's the asset condition? So that the aquifer mapping study established that uh, uh, the aquifer was in ex excellent condition. The hydrogeologists that we had working for us were really thrilled to be working on the Gibson's aquifer uh, because invariably when they were called in to do mapping studies is because we have a problem. Uh, our wells are running dry during peak demand times or, or during the summer we're really noticing higher counts of whatever bacteria or what have you. And Gibson's aquifer was healthy when they, when they came in and it's still healthy and they were really thrilled to be involved in, in something proactive. Uh, we did receive a grant for that, so we were very fortunate to to have that. It was a roughly a half million dollar project. We establish our what our operations and maintenance plan. So we've though, although that list there is 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 what we've done for our operations and maintenance. We've got a policy. We've uh, established an aquifer protection area. Um, we've uh, updated our water regulation bylaw for aquifer protection, including zoning bylaw as well. DCC bylaw includes the cost of using natural assets and monitoring wells. Uh, we do a regular inspections of our wells. We do a regular monitoring uh, program, um, universal metering uh, by ba basically being responsible with the, with the water that's being pumped out of the aquifer and a cross connection control program. And that cross connection control program stops contaminants coming from private property, whether it be business or residential, back into the town system. Right now we've got, um, <clears throat> excuse me, we use all our supply wells as, as monitoring points. So right now we've got uh, four supply wells and we've got uh, four, five, six, seven monitoring wells. And uh, we also monitor a couple or three other uh, private wells uh, as part of that network. Um, the We'll be going into this a little bit more, but uh, part of our operations and maintenance plan would be uh, establishing a groundwater management framework that would involve all local governments. Um, and we, as I mentioned, we want to broaden that uh, coastwide. So, you know, although our interest uh, is the Gibson's aquifer, uh, we're interested in the water supply all throughout the coast, uh, whether it be groundwater or surface water. Establish your financial plan. Um, so it's important to be setting appropriate water rates. Uh, we uh, rolled out our metered rate uh, in hindsight a little early before we had adequate data. The SCRD is busy collecting data as far as water use so, so that when uh, they roll out a metered rate, uh, it's going to be well informed. Uh, they're going to be able to be looking at, at water use patterns. Um, what we found is that we made projections, uh, set our rates, and then water consumption, well, you saw our water consumption down, the spin-off from that is that, uh, of course, it's, it uh, reduces your, your revenue. Um, and eventually you hit that plateau, and I think that we're getting there to that, to that, uh, to that right level there of water rates and, and uh, not seeing our, um, our water use uh, change dramatically from, from what we are right now. We do that uh, review of all wa our water rates annually. Uh, so we punch in all our infrastructure, including our monitoring program for the aquifer, uh, and make sure that, uh, that we have our rates set appropriately. So another thing that's really important with groundwater is ongoing assessment. Um, and as I mentioned, we've got an annual mo monitoring program. Uh, we've just installed two, two monitoring additional monitoring wells that uh, uh, we'll monitor for possible saltwater intrusion and mon uh, uh, monitor aquifer pressure. 
And what we will do, or what we are doing, is comparing the, uh, the actual data that's collected physically from the aquifer in comparison to the projections that were made in the 2009-2013 uh, study uh, to determine how uh, they correlate. And uh, so far, they're, they're correlating well. Um, but uh, it's, it's really, really important to continue that ongoing monitoring to see how weather patterns changing, increased demand is, is changing, how that's affecting the aquifer. The, uh, what is the ultimate supply capacity? I've already talked to you about that. Um, and, uh, and we've managed to expand the service area and save uh, uh, some of the water from Chapman Lake. Um, uh, or at least we will do by the time we uh, uh, finish our program. And another thing on here that's important with, with groundwater is you can see Chapman Lake there and you can, if you've seen it during drought conditions, you can see clearly what the water level is like and, and uh, uh, how critical the water level happens to be at any given time. You don't have that with the aquifer. Uh, it's out of sight, it's out of mind, and, and or it's it's out of sight and you have to be careful that it's not completely out of mind uh, because you do not have those, uh, those visual cues that uh, you can see every, every, uh, whenever you want up at Chapman Lake, uh, which is why we have that uh, regular monitoring program. Uh, a few quotes out of the, uh, uh, our aquifer mapping study. Uh, so there is a risk of saltwater intrusion as groundwater extraction from the aquifer uh, increases. Um, and that's why we've got those uh, additional monitoring wells. Uh, it's not to say that salt water will intrude, uh, but we, you know, we're going to have uh, advanced warning should that, uh, should that be happening and then change our, either change our, our use patterns or relocate wells further up gradient uh, uh, should the needs ar need arise. Um, I've already mentioned this, but worth mentioning again, climate change, the variability and the effects on the aquifer recharge are somewhat uncertain and can only be quantified by long-term monitoring trends and assessing the cause and effect response in the aquifer. It's not like an engineered asset. It is a natural asset, and, you, and the, the, um, uh, the gravels, how that uh, uh, reacts to, with, with water increases and reductions from snowpack, it's, it's not as, as clear-cut, and, and you have to keep a, uh, a better eye on it than, than you do uh, some other assets. Uh, well, that, there you are. We've already done some additional wells uh, in in advance of significant land development, so so that's in place already. And it's important. It was important for us to get the monitoring, the additional monitoring wells installed prior to uh, um, expanding the service area into Zone Three, so that we could get to establish a baseline um, uh, before we we did that increase. Um, and at the, at the time, this was uh, the Gibson's aquifer should be able to supply the town's water supply needs for 7,300 population, even under moderate to extreme climate change predictions. That 700, uh, sorry, 7,300 population is now 10,000. We're using less water than the 7,300 was at the time. Uh, we've got some, uh, uh, the Ministry of Forest Lands, Natural Resources, Operations and Rural Development. Uh, usually referred to as Flinro. Uh, they now have a licensing program for groundwater, which is a great thing to see. And we've recently received uh, our license for uh, about three quarters of a million cubic meters a year, which is our uh, current use a little, way, little ways down the road. We've also got two other applications in for the uh, uh, Zone 3 expansion and the build out of the town. We want to be able to protect the water for uh, our, our ultimate build out. And it's kind of neat because uh, in the province we're, we're getting recognition as well. Um, and there, that quote is, is uh, taken from uh, correspondence to the town from, from Flint Row. Um, and, and we're recognized as, as leaders in groundwater management. A uh, little graph there, uh, the blue band uh, is our current Zone 3 license, uh, or sorry, Zone 1 and 2 license. The green band is our Zone 3 license, and the aquifer capacity is that yellow band. The red band was going back to the, um, uh, prior to the aquifer study, what our water use was at. So you can see we're going to, you know, exceed the, the capacity of the aquifer. Um, if we had stayed on that track. 
The yellow line was the 2011 uh, consumption, which was 573 liters per capita. And then the, the uh, blue and the green are uh, using our 400 liters per capita uh, per day. And you can see the green line with zones, all three zones that we are within that aquifer capacity. We have a bulk water supply agreement with the, uh, the regional district. Uh, we have that single point of connection and uh, uh, we are reviewing that um, uh, this year with the regional district staff. Um, and some amendments are likely uh, going to have to happen because uh, of the change in, in demand that we're going to have from the regional district water supply. I'm going to hand over the regional governance uh, piece to, to uh, Mr. Shado here and let him speak Thanks, to that. Dave. Appreciate it. So we have multiple systems on the coast and multiple jurisdictions and not as much coordination and collaboration as we need to have. Um, hence our interest last year in, in proposing a, a regional governance for the coast. And uh, in essence, in a practical sense, it envisions a table, a governance table that uh, includes uh, not just the local governments, but also takes advantage of uh, the incredible knowledge of uh, indigenous uh, cultures as well, uh, the citizen science, and of course not to forget business and industry who have uh, a lot at stake as well. And right now, most of those folks are not at the table. And um, so in um, the, the collaborative model uh, is already in place in, uh, in, in other areas. And you can see uh, probably the most advanced one being um, in, in the Okanagan Basin. And those folks have, uh, have a reason uh, to be concerned about their amount of water and, uh, and their use. And it's a formal board, which is not at all what we're proposing here. Um, a closer example, perhaps, is the, the couch and watershed. Uh, they were just approved recently in the last election. In fact, they uh, got approval to set up a water function. And, uh, and that's uh, perhaps a good model for us to keep an eye on. And uh, then a Chaco and uh, up uh, in that area, there it's more of a discussion table and sharing information and so on. The, I think part of the benefit of, for the obvious need for coordination uh, around policies and practices and so on, uh, it's also to, to build trust, which is something that's very important as we build our, our relationships and uh, increase the knowledge uh, that we have. We have folks like Mr. Newman here who's, who's been uh, you know, spends a lot of his time managing these assets, and uh, we have a lot to share on that front. And there's also operational efficiencies from uh, uh, having experienced folks that we can sort of cross-train and, and, and benefit from as well. So we understand that uh, last year uh, the district received a proposal from us and considered, but I. Uh, we haven't moved much further on that, and so we're sort of coming back um, in, in light of our current situation and, uh, and saying, you know, this is still very uh, important to us, and I mentioned it's very important to, to all of you as well, so we, we want to suggest a model to move forward that would see on, and in a practical way the town of Gibsons manage the Gibsons uh, watershed and the regional district uh, uh, operates the, the other sources on the coast, but we share policies and approaches. And, uh, on the governance side, um, it's where decisions about uh, how it relates to growth, for example, or the capacity of our area, um, we will all be um, involved, and yourselves particularly at, at, the, at the political level, to provide that guidance that we, uh, right now, you know, I don't know how many years ago that we were here in Seashell, but we should be familiar, more familiar with each other's systems and, uh, and, uh, and share that. We have a high degree of confidence in the amount of water that the coast has. Uh, so we have no concerns about that. We have concerns about the lack of coordination, but we're also seeing that the opportunity is there to, to continue that. We'll, uh, as a practical next step, I think that 
it's a matter of, of uh, appointing members from each local government to just start a discussion, so a process similar to what was done to create the Regional Economic Development Organization. Then it took a little time, but you know it's up to the region to determine what model you have. It's not a question of just importing somebody else's model. Um, I would prepare this slide. This is what we've been using to talk to council about as well. But what we try to demonstrate here is that our watersheds are complex, and uh, the Chapman watershed is in some ways probably even more complex than this. But just as an example here, like these are the types of agencies that operate. They are responsible for the use, um, and this is supposed to mimic the. So this is the top of Mount Elphinstone, and uh, as it travels across Gibson's. You know, up in the, the top of the mountain where we've been engaged with the Ministry of Forests so that as they issue permitting for forestry activity, they know where our aquifer recharge area is, for example, and they can provide direction to the works to protect the recharge. And that's just sort of to deal with drinking water. Um, you know, likewise, at the, um, at the SCRD in Vancouver Coastal Health, uh, those folks are responsible for land use and approval of, of drinking water licenses as well, and even uh, liquid management plans. And uh, when they approve uh, a subdivision, it has impacts for the District of Seashells treatment plants and the Town of Gibson's plants, because ultimately, when we're talking about drinking water or, 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 uh, or sewer treatment, uh, those things are intricately connected. And so just to understand who's affecting each other's uh, works and uh, Right now, we're all somewhat operating within our own little boxes and not coordinating as much as we need to. So we met uh, also recently with Vancouver Coastal Health just to understand their processes and, and likewise uh, to share where, where we're at. So just, just a bit of an example. And um, I think this uh, sort of wraps up our, uh, no, not yet, Dave, uh, pr premature. So just to try to sort of summarize our, our presentation and uh, a little bit about what the next steps would, would entail on that. So our, from our next steps uh, moving forward here uh, from town as well as, as regionally, um, so we, we've actually completed the supply and of the uh, installation of a supply well and, a mo and monitoring wells in, in, uh, uh, during February. Um, we're, our design is currently underway for our Zone 3 booster station. Um, we're currently in budgeting, so we're reviewing funding options for 2019 construction. Um, we need to uh, finalize the uh, bulk water agreement review um, uh, as it pertains to the impact that the Zone 3 change would have on the regional district. Um, in the area of natural asset management, uh, we are going to be you know, carrying on with our monitoring program. That, that monitoring program is embedded in our operations and maintenance budgets. It's not a capital budget that, that uh, um, is, is up uh, on the same level as, a, as an improvement. This is an operations and maintenance, just as it is with, uh, um, with engineered asset. Um, and that's going to determine as whether or not uh, the the change for Zone Three is is permanent. Whether we can actually uh, continue to supply uh, Zone Three right to build out. That is all the projections are so showing that. All our monitoring is showing that. However, you know, ongoing monitoring will will uh, um, underline it and and uh, uh, ensure that we're we're managing it appropriately. Uh, we're seeking the SCRD support to omit the Mahan uh, well site from consideration. The Mahan well uh, is, uh, they, they, uh, the regional district did some groundwater exploration. Uh, Mahan site was, was one of uh, four sites that they explored. Uh, the town of Gibson's had concerns about that uh, because that is uh, um, actually tapped into the Gibson's aquifer and should the regional district consider drawing more water off the, the uh, Gibson's aquifer that could affect our projections and our ability to service our own our own town. Um, we're also seeking the SCRD support for the town amended water licenses. We've got, as I mentioned, we had three water licenses. We've got the first one through. We're now applying for the zone three one, or, or sorry, we have the, that had processed the zone three uh, expansion and the full build out of the town. 
And so when we go for water licenses, affected parties are, are uh, in the referral process. Uh, so Flinro uh, seeks uh, input from, from affected parties and the regional district uh, is a potential affected party. So we're seeking their support for, uh, for those water licenses. And establishing a groundwater management zone and a water management plan for Gibson's Aquifer. So the water management zone is, is uh, establishing the area that we need to apply protective measures to. Um, and then how we manage that, uh, the, the boundary of the, uh, the Gibson's Aquifer does not uh, lie with the uh, municipal boundaries. Uh, we, it expands out beyond, uh, and we would uh, be seeking that from the regional district as well as to see some uh, uh, cohesiveness with their uh, regulations uh, so that uh, uh, you know, we couldn't have a, a well, a significant well be drilled in and, and uh, uh, into the Gibson's Aquifer and, and uh, threaten our ability to, to service our town. And then regional governance, Manny's uh, spoken to that. Uh, the, uh, we're seeking support in principle from all coast local governments um, and would we'll begin by convening an advisory committee representing all stakeholders um, stewarding the process, assessing the capacity and resource requirements to pursue this work and, and give us a vision for the future. And then uh, out of that, develop that terms of reference and project charter, um, defining the scope and scale of the work to be undertaken, and, uh, and then creating a technical advisory committee uh, with representations from, from multiple third party agencies and organizations. We've got a lot of knowledge on the coast and, uh, and uh, there's, we would certainly be drawing from and uh, we'll be seeking uh, other appropriate professionals to assist us in this, um, in this endeavor. So any questions from anybody? I could go on all night about this and, but I'm sure you've got other things on your agenda. All right, councillors, any questions? Councillor Lamb. He's still there, but no questions. Okay. Um, I had, I mean, you pointed out um, this at the end here. So you, in your zoning bylaw, you have that a permit is required to drill, and your water regulation bylaw is aquifer protection. But as you said, the boundaries don't line up. Correct. So you can control that within the town boundaries, but not outside. Correct. So by actually setting up the advisory committee, potentially there could be some collaboration and cooperation around that. And, and that, um, that could not only affect the Gibson's aquifer, but that the same sort of principles as far as groundwater management could apply to other areas that the regional district would uh, be seeking groundwater. Um, drawing ground. So, uh, yes, it's, uh, it's extremely important just for the health of groundwater management uh, in general as well as the town's water supply. Okay. What, what we're, if I may, Mr. Mayor, uh, yes. Madam, Mayor Seegers, the, um, whether it's on the Elphinstone side or uh, Area F as well, the official community plans and the zoning uh, guidelines that are in those areas don't necessarily recognize that there's an aquifer underneath of it. And so the works, whether you're drilling a large foundation or things that would normally require a permit just to say, can you have somebody to look at before we drill this foundation? This is what we do in Gibsons. And uh, so we have those systems, but just outside of our boundaries that could be happening and we would know about it. And I think that's, that's not a situation that we think uh, should continue. Um, so it's a question of amending some of those policies and um, as they re we review development applications, follow a similar process that we have, and, and then we exchange that information. Okay, and you mentioned uh, setting up an advisory committee. Will you be sending something to us with a request? Uh, yes, we will. And I think we'll probably a suggestion is that we just start with you know, a discussion table, mm -hmm. and from there then uh, appoint some folks that uh, could go and do some work and then come back similar to the economic development process or other types of processes. But I think a sit down probably facilitated discussion just to uh, get a sense of where everyone is at and uh, start to lay out the next steps. It's, it's uh, the province of BC, they've been supporting two or three of these already and I think they want to see more of those. And uh, as you can see with different decisions, whether it's up, you know, parks, 
uh, uh, MOE decision or a mine approval process or other types of uh, implications that we have, and then we will somewhat describe it in the absence of that. Mm -hmm. And do you have funding to facilitate the advisory committee process? At this point, we, we, we certainly have funding on our part to, to host a few meetings and, and do some of that work, uh, but not to an ongoing basis. I think seeking some funding um, would be sort of a, a next step from the, the province. Uh, that would be where our opportunity probably lies. Okay. Councillors, any other questions? Councillor Lamb, do you have questions? I think he's there, right? Okay, can't hear him. Okay. No other questions? Thank you for being here. Thank you for the presentation. And we look forward to further conversation. Thank you. So we have a proclamation. This is for World Lymphedema Day, March 6, 2019. Whereas lymphedema is a disease afflicting more than 250 million people worldwide, it's from the World, World Health Organization, with disfigurement, disabilities, discomfort, pain, and distress. And whereas lymphedema is an accumulation of high protein oh, lymphatic God. fluid, that causes swelling in the body which impairs mobility function, can cause pain, significantly impact quality of life, and lead to severe infection or the loss of use of limbs for the affected person, regardless of age or gender. And whereas there is currently no cure for lymphedema, and whereas in recognition of the severe physical, emotional, psychosocial, and financial impacts and consequences lymphedema has on patients and families, it is time to support the courageous individuals living with this debilitating disease as well as their caregivers, both professionals and laypersons. And whereas 2019 marks the fourth annual year where World Lymphedema Day is observed and recognized throughout Canada and the world, now therefore, I, Darnelda Seegers, on behalf of the District of Seashell Council, do hereby proclaim that March 6, 2019 shall be known as World Lymphedema Day in the District of Seashell. And we have Christine Chandler. She's going to just say a few words. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mayor and councillors, thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, if I say lymphedema to most people, I will get a blank stare. And unfortunately, that's too, all too common occurrence, even among medical professionals. Interestingly enough, there are one million people, it's estimated one million people in Canada, but it's hard to get true figures. There is a, a national, or sorry, a global limb print study that is going on right now to try and establish absolute concrete numbers. But many people with lymphedema are actually categorized with edema, which is a curable condition. And many people have had swelling, and you know that you can get rid of it. Lymphedema is a disease that is incurable. And the only um, hope on the radar at the moment is because lymphedema is not a sexy condition, and it's actually um, being an incurable, then a lot of profession, medical professionals are not interested. However, just recently there has been um, some interest because some of our members in BC have gone to Taiwan, they've been going to the States, they've gone to Korea, and there's a um, new plastic surgery that is on the horizon. There are three different kinds of surgeries that might take place, and uh, it's in the very infant stages, very, very expensive. We're talking $100,000 for maybe one minor surgery. Um, so UBC is now quite interested in offering that option. And we are working with them. That's been part of our advocacy efforts. Um, and they're hoping, they've got a doctor that they're sending on global sabbatical, they're describing it, uh, to be trained. And they're uh, going to the UBC Foundation for funding for the surgery. And they hope to be starting surgeries by this summer. Those initial surgeries will not be for people who have lymphedema. Our condition is sometimes very complex. I think the initial surgeries are going to be for people who are having a mammogram, and that's where a lot of lymphedema patients develop after they've had a mammogram and there's been significant damage to the lymph system, lymph node removal. Now the leading surgery in Boston is um, 
immediately transferring the lymph system back into the circulatory system. And that might be the beginning stages of the surgeries being offered in BC. Um, BCLA is a non-profit organization. Every province has, a non has an organization such as ourselves because there is no medical treatment and no medical coverage for lymphedema, period. The only places where there is some research going on and some treatment is in Alberta, where there's been something like an over $12 million donation from an individual couple, and I believe one partner has lymphedema. And so they have a treatment clinic in both Edmonton and Calgary. And there are three doctors working in Montreal who work out of the University of McGill, and they have a clinic because that's part of their research. That is the only lymphedema service provided in Canada. So we have a lot of work to do. So meantime, the nonprofit organizations, we provide education. We provide support, support groups. We have a whole series of support, emotional support groups set up around the province now, and I'm working on getting more going. Um, we um, lead people to where there are resources, but people have to pay for everything that they require to be done. And many people, are, their work is compromised because of their disability, and they can't afford those services. And then we also do a lot of advocacy work. Um, I just wanted to share with you, there would be quite a surprising statistic, that if you put all the people with AIDS, multiple sclerosis, ALS, Parkinson's, and Parkinson's and muscular dystrophy together, there are more people with lymphedema than that whole group combined, and yet everybody knows of those other conditions. So I really appreciate you giving me the opportunity to help raise the awareness on March the 6th, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll uh, look forward to more prospects and more development in the treatment of lymphedema. Thank you for the presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you for being here. And Christine, uh, yeah. thank you. All right, so let's move on to 5.1, adoption of the minutes of the previous council meeting. First, a motion to, re to adopt, moved and seconded. Any errors or omissions? All those in favor? Thank you. Aye. And is there any business arising from the minutes? None. Let's move on to bylaw. Uh, this is item 8.1A. First, a motion to receive. This is with regards to the zoning bylaw amendment bylaw number 25283 for Clayton family lands. Moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Thank you. And did you want to speak to this, Tracy? Thank you, Mayor and Council. So this is um, bylaw number 25283-2016 for adoption. It's a seven-lot subdivision located um, between Barnacle and Highway 101 in the Clayton Land subdivision. Um, I just wanted to point out that there um, was asking for a change uh, in uh, recommendation number two, that was to remove a previous condition of rezoning pertaining to the Binney uh, Transportation Impact Assessment. It was reviewed um, and it was changed for this particular development. The applicant has agreed to construct a pedestrian and bike pathway along the, the frontage part at Highway 101, and so that is in lieu of that. So it would be altering the uh, condition that was initially approved by council. And that concludes, thank you. Thank you, so in recommendation number two, it's talking about removing that condition. Do we need to add the other one or is that, the other one is added? Sorry, the other one is actually incorporated into the servicing agreement okay. and they're constructing it. Okay, thank you. Any questions from council? So would someone like to move recommendation two? Moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. And then recommendation three? 
Recommendation number three moved and seconded. All in favor of recommendation three? Thank you. Aye. So then we'll move to uh, item 8.1B on page 25. So this is to adopt bylaw number 25 283 216, Clayton Family Lands, a bylaw to amend the District of Seashelt Zoning Bylaw number 25 1987 by rezoning a property in the West Seashelt neighborhood from R4 to R1. And who would like to move adoption? Moved and seconded. All in favor of adoption? Thank you very much. Aye. And we're on to council reports. Wow. Okay, how about if we start with Councillor Rowe? <laughs> well, I'm going to, I don't have um, a lot to report. Um, I spent last week on vacation from my job on Vancouver Island. Um, in the snow, but part of what um, we did do is the, attend the elected officials um, seminars in Parksville. Um, I think, yeah, all of us at the table were there and <clears throat> going to um, elected official school. There were some very, very timely um, presentations um, that uh, related to stuff that was going on at home around emergency management. Um, and so we were able to have some conversations with um, some people and we met lots of uh, people from other areas in Vancouver Island. So it was a good opportunity um, for learning um, and networking. Other than that, um, I think I'm gonna leave it at that. Thank you. Councilman Klein. All right. Um, first of all, I want to thank the public public work staff for their work during all this snow during the last week. Um, they did a tremendous job, so I want to publicly thank them. Um, yesterday, I was in Victoria for the presentation of the provincial budget. I was there, there on behalf of the Alliance of BC Students. Um, I'm a member of the Cap Lionel Students Union. I'm taking a couple of classes there. Um, so we were there for the announcement of um, the provincial government removing student loan interest, um, which uh, it's going to be really big for a lot of students right across BC and former students as well. Um, while I was there, I also tried to talk to a couple ministers. So I talked to Carol James, the Minister of Finance, um, and I also talked to uh, Minister Farnworth, uh, uh, the public safety minister. Um, we spoke briefly uh, about some of the challenges at Sea-Watch, um, and he confirmed that he is aware of the project and the Premier is aware of the, pro the, the issues as well. Um, and that's about as far as the conversation went. Unfortunately, it was quite quick. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Toth. Um. Yeah, I too was in Parksville for LGLA and it was a pretty harrowing adventure for us to get there, thanks to the mayor's husband's driving. Um, this last week and a half has been hard on Seashelt. Uh, multiple snowfalls, uh, evacuation alert, an evacuation order. Um, I'm amazed at the turnout of our community. High school kids, contractors, people bringing food, trailers, boxes. Uh, or just a couple arms to help move things. Um, I want to say thank you to everyone, every resident of Seashelt who went to help. You all really stepped up in a way that the municipality itself could not. Um, one of our local realtors has started a fundraising campaign to help residents. And if you're able to, I'm sure it'd be most appreciated. That's it for me. Thank you, Councillor Kustier. I don't really have much else to report. Um, basically, what Brenda said and all, uh, we did attend the LGLA sem uh, conference, and for me, it was very beneficial um, to meet others and learn new ideas and just under better understand the guidelines for municipal elected officials. And yeah, it just it really hit home with um, getting to discuss some of the situations we were dealing with here and. Uh, 
I learned a lot. That's all I have to say. Echo what everyone else said as well. Okay, I don't think I have much to, to offer. I just want to acknowledge um, Councillor Rowe. One of the sessions, uh, Frank Leonard, who was uh, he's a long time political animal on all kinds of different boards and whatever. Some of you have probably seen him around. Um, he did a session on political jeopardy, which was looking at conflict of interest kinds of situations. And he had a panel. And Councillor Rowe was front and center right up there. <laughs> so it was, it was a lot of fun. Um, it, it is, it's always an opportunity to kind of step back and look at what we're doing. Um, I want to acknowledge the staff here for the training that they've given already this, you know, to the new council. Uh, because I think while they went over a lot of that stuff there, what you provided, I think, was a foundation that allowed this council to build on. So it wasn't totally new, right? It added, and, and I think the, some of the things that were duplicated were then actually, they reiterated or inf reinforced what had already been provided. So thank you for that. All right, SCRD report, um, no meetings last week. Yay. Uh, so we were away. We did have one meeting this morning. It was focused on solid waste and recycling and there'll be it was more of a workshop kind of format so uh, some decisions are made at the regional district around moving forward but they've already they've asked for a little bit more information from staff as well around uh, organics and um, recycling uh, the decision today was that they would go with uh, curbside pickup of organics but not recycling they would stay with the uh, regional depots. So that's pretty much it. Uh, we're back into the regular rotation tomorrow. Right. So we can move on to council correspondence. I have first a motion to receive the correspondence. Moved and seconded. All in favor? Thank you. Aye. Sorry, Councilor Lamb, I don't think you have a report for council. Do you? Uh, you don't want to hear it. Okay. No. <laughs> Okay, so uh, the first item in the correspondence is a request to waive the fee for the Community Volunteer Income Tax Program. So this program is sponsored by Canadian Revenue Agency, and it's put each year they operate it, they offer it through the Community Resource Centre. This year, the Community Resource Centre is moving uh, location during the time that they actually would be offering it free of charge to the community. So they've come to us and asked if we could provide the uh, Rockwood Center to them at no cost because they don't charge for their service and they have no fees. It's basically a totally volunteer service. So we do, staff did put a recommendation together for us. Who would like to move the recommendation and we can read it? if that's what you'd like to do. Councillor McLean? Yeah, I'll uh, move that the request to waive rental fees at the Rockwood Centre on Tuesdays in March and April for 2019 for the Community Volunteer Income Tax Program be approved. And would someone like to second that? Second that? Any questions? I think it's pretty straightforward, right? There's very uh, rigorous criteria for it, you know, income amounts, um, it can't be complex, they do it while you wait. And uh, this is, how many did they do last year? I forget how many they said they did. Hundred, hundreds, yeah. 971, 979, okay. So they do a lot of these. So I think this is, this is um, a great opportunity for us to support this, com this community organization. All those in favor, thank you. Aye. Now staff also put, brought forward one more policy that we could consider. Um, so it's with regards to, like we don't currently have a policy where we would waive facility rental fees. Is this something that we would like staff to work on? This is, I think this is the first time we've ever had this request to waive fees for an organization like this. Do we want staff to go away and put together a policy or do we want to see if something else comes forward at some point and then work on a policy? I mean, it's been years, right? Councillor Rowe? To staff, can anyone 
remember the last time there was a request? No. I just wonder with everything else we're tasking them with yeah. at this time whether this needs to be a priority. Okay. My thoughts. Looks like everybody's in agreement. All right. Let's uh, leave that as it is. Any emergency items? None? Motion to adjourn. Moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Thank you. All right. Yeah, and 